keep working until you really have what you want. It's really easy to, under the pressure of four or five musicians in the room and everybody wants to get going and just play. And sometimes it just takes a little bit to get the sound right. And I think you have to resist the urge to settle for, yeah, that's pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and push it until you're like, I love the way all this sounds. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Anthony Gravino an independent record producer, engineer, and musician based in Chicago, Illinois. He works primarily out of his private studio, affectionately known as The Drake. And Anthony's work includes an eclectic variety of styles across many genres, including rock, jazz, blues, folk, pop, classical, metal, R&B, hip-hop, and a lot of stuff in between. I'm not really sure what, what else there is in between, but, you know, that's a, that's a lot of stuff, which is awesome. Um, artists he has worked with include Davey Knowles, Hood Smoke, Matt Eulery, The Claudettes, Marquis Hill, Bunny Patootie, that's a great name, Stu Mindeman, Noah Harris, and many more. Uh, Anthony and I connected back in the spring through Recording Studio Rockstars on Facebook, and I had a chance to check out Anthony's work and really dug it. So here we are today to talk about making great records, capturing the, quote, illusion at the moment of inception, quote, and how equipment influences the process and the sonic emotional impact of the final record and everything else we can think of to talk about from the studio. Please welcome Anthony Gravino to Recording Studio Rockstars. Anthony, are you ready to rock? Let's rock, Lidge. Nice, dude. So, Anthony, tell us more about who you are and, you know, how'd you get into this recording stuff? And then tell us a little bit about your studio and your space and where you work. Well, I moved to Chicago uh, in 1999 to pursue a career as a musician. I was a guitar player at the time and singer and um, played in a bunch of bands. And through the course of playing in bands, um, you know, had some several recording um, situations and kind of the uh, first few that I had were really frustrating. And then I finally got into a band that worked with some really good engineer producers and kind of opened my eyes to, uh, you know, the importance of it and how people approach it. And that's when I got the bug. And I was, I was about 15 years ago and I bought a little cheap little M box and a, uh, a computer. It was really expensive at the time, actually, you know, and it, it was kind of crappy and I just started making recordings on that. And then I got to step the, the rig up a little bit and I started inviting my friends over and we would just record stuff for fun. And then, at a certain point, some people came to me and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in recording my band? I like those demos that we made, you know, of your song or whatever. And uh, so said, sure, and started doing that. And I mean, I really never intended to actually get into the engineering and mixing and stuff like that, but it just kind of happened. Yeah. Um, Were you, um, so I, you know, it's funny you bring up the inbox. It's sitting behind me over my shoulder. <laughs> it's the old, old, like light blue color. Yeah, yeah, I remember it well. It's got that stupid knob that goes between the like uh, dry and oh the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the first clever um, solution for latency for using yeah. a, a you know a, um, a native system at box. Um, but does is yours also held together with um, orange gaff tape like mine is? Uh, I no longer have mine, so I, I, <laughs> I'm assuming mine is in the landfill at this point. But I can't say for sure. I did sell it. Yeah. Um, do we, and were you sort of like traveling around with a laptop to be able to use something like that? No, actually, <clears throat> I I was living in this two flat building that a friend of mine owned, and the basement was sort of finished, but there was nothing down there, and so he just kind of let me use the basement. So I just I had a actually like a desktop, old Mac desktop, and and the M box. And then I got a Midas Venice and a little 002. Yeah. And that was like big upgrade, you know. Wow. You skipped the 001. Never. Uh, that was like a little, I was still doing like tape when the 001 was happening. Yeah. Come to think of it, the 001 was pre-M box, wasn't it? 
Yeah, it was the first. It was like the first one that like normal people could afford. Sort man, of. I, I've been around for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel the same way. I'm like going, oh man, that was 18 years ago or something like that. Um, it's sort of funny when the equipment that is in your distant past, you remember dreaming about it arriving one day. Totally. You know, you remember it seemed thinking, like a whole new cool? world. Yeah. And then the Mbox was the very first sort of little box interface like that, as far as I recall, too. Um, unless I'm yeah. sh- shortchanging anything. And then if, now, of course, it's ubiquitous and like there's, you know, everybody makes some tiny little box with a USB jack and, and a couple of inputs on it. And they sound great today. That's you know? what I was going to say. Yeah. Most of them sound good. That thing, oh boy, it I was a wake up call to me the first time I ever sort of did a little mix on it or whatever of something and some simple little thing I'd recorded it. And then I remember taking it out to my car and listening to it in my car. I also didn't have good monitors. And I just remember listening going, this is terrible. Why does, <laughs> it, why does this sound so bad? What do I have to do? Now, what was your reference at that point? Just being a fan of records that sounded good or had you had a little bit of ex- exposure to real studios and recording in them? I had done some stuff in real studios and a band that I was in, called Temple of Low Men. We made some recordings that were really good. They were, you know, we worked with this guy, Adam Schmidt, and this other guy, John Pines. And uh, they were just really good engineers. They were the first good engineers that I was around. And that really made me like see, okay, this is how they do it. There's like a lot more to this than I thought. You know, you've got to be an artist about this, not just a technician, you know? Yeah. And yeah, this that was really this important. the same Jonathan Pine that's working with um, Rupert Neve. Now it is. A, oh, he's great. He's supposed to be on the show, Jonathan. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should have him. John is great. He was definitely someone who I consider one of my mentors. He was always there if I, you know, had to call him up and ask him a technical question or you know, what, can, what, what should I get? You know, should I get this mic or this compressor? And he'd always have really good feedback. And I, when I'd go back and listen to stuff, if I'd get a piece of gear, it would always like do what he said, you know, it, he was very good about that. So, and this is all in Chicago. This was taking place. This was actually in Champaign Urbana because he, he lives down there. And, uh, I was in a band that was actually based out of there. I was living in Chicago, but I, I, this band was based there. So we were working with guys down there and we worked in John's studio and we worked in, uh, this place called Pogo. That yeah. Was owned by, Mark Rubel. Yeah. Mark Rubel. I mean, he, you know, he, that was back when he still had the Pogo north in in champagne and now he of course lives in nashville yeah <laughs> so rock stars you may recognize mark rubel's name because he runs the blackbird academy down here at blackbird studios in in nashville and um he has also been responsible for inviting a lot of the great guests that you've heard on the show mark's a great guy one of my favorite people yeah he's a connector <laughs> totally That's thanks a great mark. Way to describe it <laughs> Well, that's very cool. So, um, all right. So you had you graduate from, uh, I guess, you know, sort of gear by gear, you sort of worked your way up from an M box to the studio you have now, because now you have a beautiful place, right? Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I love, I love it here. I've been here for 12 years now and it's cozy and it, I have a lot of equipment that I'm really familiar with and that I've sort of accumulated through trial and error over the years. And um, I feel like, you know, on most circumstances, I can get as good a result here as I can in a big studio, with the exception of recording live acoustic bands that are more than four people. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, when you get into things like I do a fair amount of jazz and, uh, you know, once you get into drums, piano, horns, you know, my place just isn't a big enough room and there's not enough space for that many people here. So I kind of cap it at like a rock band of four. I can do that at my place. And then everything that gets bigger than that, I need to, we need to hire a studio. Although sometimes I take rock bands to other studios too. Yeah. Well, four was a fantastic number anyway, once upon a time. So um, (laughs) that shouldn't be a problem. Now you also have, um, you've, it seems like you've got a digital world there, but you've also got analog tape and a mixing console. Yeah, I've got a, I guess they call it a hybrid rig, um, where I I have a little API console and a bunch of outboard gear, and um, I have a a Mara MCI tape machine, a quarter-inch two-track, and I like to mix to that, and I use it for, sometimes I'll just print some things to it, you know, if I 
feel like something needs a little vibe or a tape slap or if something just is a little edgy sometimes it's nice to run it over to the tape and it smooths it out a little bit um so I, you know I, I mix on the console in a kind of hybrid way where i'll s- stem some things out some important uh elements of the mix will get their its own fader or its own set of faders and then other stuff will just get summed out and then i can insert um my hardware uh eqs and compressors and effects and stuff on the console it's got insert switches yeah and i like to work that way because i'm a tactile kind of person and i'm not a good mouse pusher around her <laughs> and um i just i just find that my speed is so much faster when i can you know have the bass on an analog channel with an 1176 and a cool eq and have the vocal going through a good chain and you know i just i know how to do that and to me speed is really important in in staying uh, inspired and so i want to work fast i don't want to like sit there and and manipulate one thing at a time i want to manipulate four things at a time you know yeah. and you can't manipulate different parameters on an EQ at the same time in a, in a plug-in really without like a really good control surface. And I don't have that. So anyway, I tend to, you know, try to use the analog gear for most of the sonics and use the digital gear for its sort of storage space and linearity and, re, you know, recallability and convenience and editing abilities. So now you bring up recallability. If you're doing a hybrid system and a hybrid setup, What are some ways that you are able to like use a bunch of the analog world, but still be able to recall things that you feel like you need to recall? Well, I basically have, there's two different ways that I do it and I haven't really settled on which way is better. (laughs) Uh, One is I'll print stems. Um, After I finish the mix, I'll just print, you know, it's usually somewhere between five and 12 stereo stems, like drums, bass, you know all the main elements. And usually from those, I can recall the mix and do whatever little tweaks need to be done. Um, the other thing I do is just take pictures and and take notes. And, you know, it's not that much stuff. The console, the, most of my EQs are like API and, and stuff that's pretty easy to recall. I do mm-hmm. have a few things that are a little harder to recall, but um, it's just not that hard. I mean, usually I can, you know, use the photos, dial everything back up, put the mix up against what I had, you know, what before, and it's really close. And then I can just use my ears. And then at that point I'm trying to change it anyway. So. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's like, you know, I think the idea of recallability being exactly the same thing begs the question, if you're recalling it in the first place, why would you want it to be exactly the same as the mix you just Exactly. Um, well, that's cool, man. So, um, You know, one of the things I like to ask at the beginning of a podcast with a guest is to share an inspirational quote for hitting the studio. And I wondered if there was anything that you wanted to share with the rock stars, just get us fired up about hitting the studio. Yeah, I would say that the only rule is that there are no rules. And I stand behind that. I think that you have to be adventurous at all times. And and that one of the great things about doing art is that there doesn't have to be rules. Yeah. And I just love that. So I always try to approach uh, whatever part of the process I'm involved in with an adventurous, fearless spirit where I'm, you know, who's going to get hurt if you turn that knob all the way up? Yeah. You you know, like, okay, that's that's what they say not to do. Well, try it and see what not to do sounds like, you know? Uh, Maybe it's just what you should be doing at that moment. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because when you say the only rule is there are no rules, sometimes I think about art as being a recognition that there there are some kind of rules or parameters, like a a painting has an actual edge to the frame, yet it's how you disregard the edge of the frame that can be really, uh, you know, shocking in art. And um, and like you just said, if the implicit rule is maybe that you shouldn't turn the knob all the way up, but then you go ahead and turn it all the way up, that's what sounds so cool because you're breaking the rules too. Yeah, and it's all about just what what feels good in the moment, you know, ultimately. And if that feels good in the moment, then don't be afraid to do it. That that's how I feel about it because yeah. we're all just making personal 
you know, we all have our own subjective view of the art, the music, right? And we're all just kind of trying to do our best to inject how we see it into it. And so that there's, there doesn't have to be a, a an edge to that, like you said, yeah. <laughs> you know, that you can go over that line at any time and that might be just the thing and it might not. And you have to, uh, to me, the, the people who are the best at this are the ones that just literally listen to what's coming off the speakers and don't worry about what they think it should be or what they want it to be. They're just saying, this is what it is. Do I like it or don't I? Yeah, I remember one of the stories I, I heard early on, and I apologize for not knowing who this, you know, who the, the characters are at play in this, but it was a story about producing Led Zeppelin and how the first thing that the producer would do on the session um, and again, I apologize because there's probably a million people out there who are hearing this and goes, well, everybody knows who produced that record, but <laughs> was that, uh, they'd come in and he would immediately put tape over all the meters, just like, fuck these things. Let's not look at all these meters. Let's just make rock and roll. Um, and I always yeah. love that story, you know? I love it too. I mean, I, I, I do look at meters, but I also don't care really what they're doing if it sounds good. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, also, there was a time I did a record. This is a Chicago connection, but the band Atrixo that I was producing, co-producing with um, Lillian Berlin years ago up in, um, up in Chicago, we ended up down in Florida with Tom Lord Algae, who was mixing it. And we had you know, worked really hard to get all the sounds on, on tape. And then we brought the tape, reels of tape down. And then he was going to, this was digital tape at the time. And then he was going to transfer it from one tape machine to another. And we were all... You know, he, he just started transferring it and we could see reds uh, over us here and there. And we we're like, oh my God, are you, is that okay? Are you sure you should do this? Should we just transfer it digitally? And he just turned around and looked at us. <laughs> He's just like, what are you talking about, guys? You know, you know, here's a guy who knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly how to make it sound great. And a bunch of young kids are, uh, are in there like, you know, fretting over the fact that there's a little red light on the console. <laughs> Sounds about right, though. Yeah. Um, so, you know, speaking of, um, pushing boundaries, so, you know, sometimes you just simply do make mistakes. There are some rules maybe that would, that, uh, benefit us in the studio. And I wondered if you could share a story about something that was sort of an important failure for you or like a nightmare in the studio moment. Sure. Uh, I was working with this band Hood Smoke and uh, we, were, we were getting ready to start um, our third record together. We'd made two records before that we were really happy with. Actually, no, sorry, this our fourth record. And we made three records that we were really happy with. And so I had this great idea that my, my friend, and my, I'm from this small town called Monmouth, Illinois. And um, my friend who still lives there owns this bar and then right next to the bar is this other building that's this old 1900 early 1900s movie theater called the Rivoli. Oh cool. And it's just but it's not a theater anymore. And my friend when he got the bar he just like the theater was part of the property. So he owns the theater too and they don't really use it very much and <clears throat> he's a musician and I had you know when I was back home been visiting had you know asked him like what if I brought a band down here could I use the theater and he's like yeah you know just bring the band down and they can, you can use the theater. Don't even worry about it. Just, you know, it'd be great to make a record there. So yeah. everybody, everybody's excited. So I talked the band into it. They were super into it. I've got this mobile rig. So we packed up the mobile rig and all their gear and we took a couple of vehicles down. It's about a four hour drive South of Chicago. We get down there and the, the drummer and bass player and I got there first and we got all set up and we're in the theater and the drums are sounding cool and the room has a great vibe. And and then the guitar players were set to arrive the next day. And we started recording that night. Got, it was sounding good. We got a couple, you know, keeper takes of a couple tracks. And then all of a sudden, my computer just, like, would not work. It just died. Wow, just that's stopped. never, ever happened to me before in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we had another computer there, too, that had Pro Tools on it. And we fired it up, and it just would not work. Any everything we try, it would work for like, and the most frustrating thing is it would work for like five minutes. And is this sort minutes. of like back when you had the Digio two or something? No, like no, that? no. This was this was like uh, last year. This, this is last weekend, a, dude. <laughs> la, la, yeah, this was last year. This was just about this time last year. I think it was September. And so anyway, we spent the whole night there, and we thought, oh god, you know, we're all down here. We'd set up, and you know, drove driven all the way down. 
we had, we only had I think four days to track all the basics for the whole record. And so then the next day, the guitar players show up. We're like, let's try it again. You know, we get all set up. It kind of starts working. We get like three takes of one song done, and it starts happening again. It just starts dying. And so finally, after much sort of, you know, back and forth and grousing, we we decided, okay, we've just, this is not working. This this laptop is dead. This laptop won't run Pro Tools. I can't, you know, I don't know what's wrong. So we packed it up and we drove back and we were, you know, there were some differing opinions about what we should do. And, you know, the the guy who's the leader of the band was, he was just really bummed because it's just like we'd lost two days. Yeah. And, you know, we it was a lot of effort to load in and out and set up. It just, it was a lot of effort and it was hot. And <clears throat> anyway, so we, but the the two guitar players who had come down and had just kind of gotten in with the band and the vibe between the band was just awesome musically. So we were kind of pushing, like, let's just go back to my place and and just set up there and we got two days and let's just see what we can get done. Because the leader of the band was kind of like, ah, maybe we should just can this. Maybe this is just like a bad omen. You know, let's just like book another set of dates in the future. And we were all kind of like, no. And we came back that night, got back at like 1030 at night, loaded all the gear back into my studio, um, kind of roughly set it up and then came back the next day. And the next day, I think we cut seven of the nine songs that made it. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, the first thing we played, the first take is a keeper take. Oh, um, that's great. And, and, and there were like three or four first takes that day. It was just the, the vibe, just they all rose <laughs> to the occasion. And it was amazing. And it was and it, a really fun, really fun couple days. You know, um, I found that too. I found that there's a big difference between suggesting that the the band or the artist or the musician does another take of something when the takes the take or the takes plural that we just did or that they just did are sitting there safely on the computer have already been recorded we're already great and there's a sense of like you know okay we'll do another one versus those times where something genuinely went wrong in the studio and the and the band and the musicians are like, all right, let's do this, and everybody sort of rises to the occasion, um, and it's remarkable. It's like those times I've found that you have to do it again because it's a fix for something that screwed up have always turned out better than the original version that was being fixed because we screwed up. But 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 again, like I'm saying, I'm being redundant. But that's really different from those times where you're just like, well, let's just do it again. Yeah. Right. And I think that's like, if you have my, my philosophy is I kind of either know it's good or it's not. And it's pretty clear in my mind most of the time. And it, to me, if I think I have it, I don't want to do it again. I yeah. want to do something else because there's some fire going on right now. If they just got something and I want that to, you know, spill over into the next thing that they do. I don't want to like, you know, do three takes safety takes or whatever. And then maybe the third and fourth take are kind of like uninspired. And then all of a sudden the vibe dips a little bit because, you know, oh, we just did a couple of meh takes. And then you kind of lost that momentum. You know, I yeah. think it's like, if I've got it, why do we do it again? Why? That's it. We were listening to it and saying, that's the record. Okay, <laughs> we got it. You know, I've got a great chart on the wall. Speaking of Mara machines and Chris Mara, I think that's where I got it was from Welcome to 1979. And it's a chart that Walter Sears made years ago in New York City. And it's just a curve that like starts out and it's take one, take two. And then it's just, it just goes down. It's this downhill curve for all the takes that follow. And then somewhere way out there, there's one that like is a great take compared to the others, but it's nowhere near as good as the original takes, the first and second. <laughs> but then the really great part is then even further down there, there's one, you know, they call it like the Q zone take <laughs> at, that that when you look at the chart, you're like, is that Q zone take actually a tiny bit better than take two? You know, you're like, you're mesmerized by it. And then everything just goes into like, you know, brain dead after that. This is yeah, mind right. numbing brain death. Um, but you know, I do have a question for you. I also have felt like I've I've gotten so excited with first takes and I'm so aware of that 
that sometimes I I don't want to do another take and I might come back later and listen to the first take versus the other takes and go, oh, wait, no, those other takes were better. Have you ever found the converse to be true where you can become, it's almost like a demo-itis, like you get too precious about that first take that you have to allow yourself to let you know, let another one happen. I mean, certainly after you do a few, you're like, all right, this is sucking. Now this isn't getting getting any better. But maybe you could talk about like, how do you know when you've got a right take and and like what's some of your internal process? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, I try to trust my instincts. Definitely I have had situations where the band does, let's say three takes. And I think the first take was definitely the best one. And then when we listen back, I like the third take better, you know? Yeah. Uh, that that happens to me for sure. I feel like the, the, the only time that I really will push to just do the one take is if I feel overwhelmingly moved and, and sure that that was great. Like you just the feel one. great. Yeah. And that's pretty rare. I mean, it's very rare that I wouldn't say, yeah, do one more and let's see what you got, you know? Do you ever but notice it, that, that that's more likely to happen on a rocker, on one where it's like everybody's just like balls to the wall on that? Uh, uh, well, sorry, I'm, to the lady rock stars. Sorry, I'm not sure what the uh, the equivalent is there for that that expression. But you know, where everybody's just like blasting out and just rocking out on a take, and and like to do another one, everybody would have to take a breather first. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. That kind of stuff lends itself towards earlier takes, but in general, I think. Most like live performance based music tends to, although you know, the level of musicianship definitely uh dictates one way or the other, and just the 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 um personalities of the people involved. I think if you've got a lot of trust between people, you're a lot more likely to get a great first take because they just aren't worried about what the other person is going to not do right. Right. You know, and they're just worrying. They just know that they can just start playing. Whereas when you get, or if you get bands that come in like right off the road, you know, they just did a bunch of dates. It's like, you're really likely to get good first takes out of them. Whereas if you've got a band that maybe it's some, it's some like cats, but they don't always play together and they're all real good, but they don't necessarily haven't really developed that organic vibe yet. Um, sometimes it's good to do four or five takes with those guys and see just, where it evolves over that, you know? Yeah, because they're sort of mapping the song a little bit more. Yeah, and they're feeling each other out, you know? It, maybe not consciously, but they're l- reacting to what they're hearing, and then, and then every take they're probably honing in a little bit on it. You know? I feel like I've also noticed that um, it's the opposite of the, uh, you know, the rocker track, which is, the the sensitive one the the thoughtful track is the one where you you're more likely to get a first take in fact i think my conclusion is that everything that's in the middle that's that's mid tempo is one where you're more likely to be okay with doing like you know a few takes for sure that's actually a good point i never really thought about it like that but you're right the mid tempo stuff is is a little i feel like yeah it's a little more nuanced sometimes whereas like something slow and plodding can be kind of like you know a little Swampy and something fast can you know and rocking can speed up and slow down whereas those mid tempos you kind of got to stay in that spot you know you can't get away with as much variation in tempo and as you can with slow and fast yeah well well and then let's take this to the the overdub or the even the live performance that matters the most usually which is the vocal how do you think some of these same rules apply to a vocal performance um i think y- I think actually it doesn't apply as much to me. I think because because usually I'll get at least one or two lines out of a first take, maybe that that were just magical. But most singers, I feel like they just have to kind of learn how to sing the song in headphones sometimes, mm. and that just like and and just you know and with the track as opposed to what it's like to play with the band behind them live. You know, it's just totally different. And I find usually it's like the third or fourth take with a singer, you know, yeah. where they where they really nail most of it. Or that's when you go, yeah, that's what the vocal's supposed to be like. You know, do we need yeah. to do a couple more to like, you know, fix some things? But that's what it's supposed to sound like. That and, now it sounds like a track. 
Yeah, sorry, I'm not not trying to interrupt. Uh, in, but then of course sometimes you work on a song where the singer there are some notes that are just simply hard to sing in tune, right? And those are the ones where I might do a bunch more later, and then you know find just a couple of lines here and there. But it's an interesting thing. I mean, I you know I'm always sort of I'm forever perplexed by that because I know the process that I go through to try and get a vocal that has got all the right bits and pieces in there and all the right parts and it's in tune. But um, some days I go back and I just listen to that rough, you know, scratch vocal and I'm inspired by it, uh, you know, against a very finished, polished take where where everything's, you know, quote, right. Yeah, I often feel that way. And one thing that I like to do is I don't want the singer to hear the scratch vocal like right before they start singing the song. But if we do a few takes and my instinct is that the scratch vocal had a better vibe for whatever reason, then I will say, why don't you come in here and let's let's listen to what you did on the scratch vocal and mm-hmm. see if we can't get a little of that energy into this, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I, you make a good point. It's just like there's there's usually something good in those things, in those scratch vocals that were cut live with the band. And there's usually something about that vocal that was informing the performance of the band. And sometimes you got to kind of reverse chase that, you know, yeah. because, you know, maybe the time is just you, that day, you're just in a different mood or whatever. And you got more caffeine going on and you're a little on the front side of it. When, and it doesn't feel good with what the band played to as far as your vocal was, which was something that was more backside. And that's yeah. just an example. But I feel like that because the interaction of things is so important that it's always, you always have to keep your mind on that. Like, are, are, what is it about this that's not working with this tr- pre-existing track that's not going to budge? You know, and I've got a lot of caffeine work in here. <laughs> in <the studio. laughs> Good. Um, but, you know, but I do feel like a lesson that took me a minute to learn because I kept repeating the same mistake over and over again was um, either not remembering to reference the demo before we start cutting in the studio, like leaving it too far behind, um, or like you said, not remembering to reference that rough uh, tracking vocal as we're cutting more of the lead vocals. I mean, that's a little tricky to do if you're if you're in it. Like once you're in it, you're in it, the singer's singing, you know, you, you kind of got to run with it. But like, particularly the demo version of a song, if I've got a band in here and we're cutting a band version in the studio, boy, is it easy to just like, you know, become untethered and you start speeding things up or slowing them down or the energy lifts too much. You know, a thing that I have a tendency to do because I really love distorted guitars and I love things that rock is I'll instinctively want to push the energy more. And I've come to the conclusion of a song before where I'm listening back and it's like, oh shit, I took this song that was meant to be a little bit more clean guitar country and now it's a rock song and I don't know if that's what everybody wanted. Yeah, and sometimes you'll think, gosh, does this have as as much emotional quality as the the demo? You know? Yeah. Uh, I think you, the, the best point that you made there was the tempo because the tempo of the demo is is built around the vocal usually. You know, yep. and and that and the tempo has to serve the vocal, and so, you know, it's easy to. You're right. It's so easy to stray away from the original tempo, and then you're listening to it, going like, "Why don't I like the vocal as much now? What am I doing?" You know, and it's just literally that the vocal isn't as cool with that tempo. Yeah. Well, let's uh, talk about that process a little more. I like that we're kind of breaking down this whole like songwriting, demo, pre-production into production process, because I think that's really helpful. Um, Some different ways that a demo might happen. So one way is somebody has just written a song and they're singing it and playing it on an acoustic guitar. And the demo is, you know, recorded on the iPhone and it sounds inspired. Like there's something about the the version of that that really just makes you think this is a cool song. We should totally record this song, you know? Um, And that probably is a good example of the vocal informing the tempo of that demo. Um, And then another way is the version like, let's say I'm in the studio. I'm just going to throw myself in as an example. But let's say I'm in and I 
grabbed a cool loop and put some guitars on and then put some lyrics over it and come up with a song that I dig. In that case, the tempo might be not quite right for the lyrics. I may have made the the words and the the singing fit, but it's possible that those that the tempo could be adjusted some more. Do you think that's a that's sort of a helpful way to look at it? And do you have any thoughts about like when you know, how do you find the right tempo for a production and and know when you're sort of doing the right thing for this song? Yeah, I think you made a great point about the, about the, you know, the singer sitting there with the one instrument and the tempo really informing the vocal a lot more than if it's clicked to something and, and you're just singing a little ditty over a beat, you know? I feel like you've got more wiggle room there as far as where to start on the tempo. Yeah. Uh, what are some you, challenges that you've run into where a band comes in and you guys are really struggling with making sure you got the right tempo? Um, well, one of the challenges that I've struggled with is try, there's a couple records where there were just a lot of tempo changes that need to happen and how to, um, how to make that happen and still be able to overdub in certain sections. Yeah. Um, or another challenge I've had with tempo before is how to make a click track that you can actually play to. Because I, I remember, this is just an example, but I was doing this, this track this, with Bunny Patootie. And it's a great it, name. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a great musician. And it's got this like da 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 that's the feel right but how do you make a click track do that like that's what he wanted to play to was that you know see if we all paid more attention in in band in school you know reading the the music we'd probably know the right answer but this guy is like a he teaches rhythmic analysis okay and we could not figure out a way to make the click track do that without i mean we would had to like change the tempo like you know, 150 times or something to make it do it. I'm making that number up, but a lot. So anyway, what we did was we just had him just sit there and do that rhythm with a pair of drumsticks and make a click track. Nice. And then we played to that and it was great, you know? Um, So I've done a lot of different things, you know, to deal with tempo issues. And sometimes the answer is just like, okay, it just has to happen. You know, we just have to play it. And you guys just have to do it once like that. And then we've got it, you know, as opposed to, you know, well, how are we going to edit this together and stuff like that? Because you can always do that stuff too. But um, Well, I like the stories of like Michael Jackson in the back of the studio, you know, and he has them install speakers in the ceiling so that he can dance in the back of the control room the entire time. (laughs) Because how else are you going to know if that music is right, you know? That's great. I've never heard that story. I love it. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's the question of figuring out what, as far as tempo goes, what is the thing that's going to inform you whether it's right? You know, if it's a sensitive, quiet song, maybe you should be relaxed and, and sitting and listening when you when you listen. And if it, you know, bumps you out of your vibe, then then it's the wrong tempo. Or if it's a if it's up tempo and and you should physically be moving with your body, you know, can you do that listening to it? That's a good point too, because I have never actually really thought about that. Like, how should you listen to certain kinds of music in order to evaluate them in, uh, you know, an objective way that's going to serve the song? Well, that's what we do here on Recording Studio Rockstar. So, <laughs> so welcome, Anthony. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, our, let me jump into some questions um, before we take a break uh, to just talk to you about, you know, some of the things that you do. You had an idea. You talked about capturing the illusion at the moment of inception, which is a great, great uh, quote. Also a pretty bizarre movie. (laughs) Um, What does that mean to you? What is capturing the illusion at the moment of inception? And what would you like to talk about? Uh, Well, first, I guess I would have to define the illusion, which is, I guess, part of my recording philosophy, if I have such a thing, is that it's all an illusion. And that we are just like audio illusionists. So I like that. I don't want to be an audio illusionist. Yeah, well, you are, Lidge. Um, you make records. That's audio illusionist. Thank um, you. Because because we're we're taking something that is very unnatural in its sort of core, and we're making it appear natural. And and to do that, you have to use what I, I would call auditory illusions. You know. And, you put a mic two inches from a speaker, but 
you don't want the listener to feel like their ear is two inches from a speaker. So uh, my approach is to try to create great illusions in the speakers and or the and, and the headphones because it's important to me what the people who are performing are performing to in the moment. And so if I can through using mic techniques, microphone selection, rooms, um, uh, effects, compression, EQ, if I can create a great illusion for the band to play to in headphones, if it's if they need to be in headphones, then I feel like that is the core of what makes a great record. Um, because A, you, you've got good sound right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So anything that you do after that is going to be referencing that which will be pretty close to what the final thing should sound like. Yeah. As opposed to leaving a lot of decisions like, oh, we'll EQ that later. Or we'll compress that later. It's like, I don't want to do that. I want to do it right now. I want to make it go into this thing and sound exactly how I want it to sound. And I don't always get that. And I don't usually get that, but I get close. You know, it's and, one of the reasons why I would get frustrated whenever we would lay down a scratch, a scratch track, you know, working with the band who was like, well, let's just get the click right. And we'll just, we'll just throw down some bullshit vocal as a guide or, or a bullshit guitar as a guide. And I would always feel frustrated because it was like, but it doesn't sound any good. And how the hell am I supposed to add something to that? You know? Exactly, exactly. And, and that's not inspiring. And ultimately part of, I think, the job of being an engineer is to inspire the artist. And part of inspiring the artist is getting them to sound good in whatever they're listening to while they're doing the performance, whether it be in the room or in the speakers or in the headphones. They need it to sound great at the moment that they're making the take because that makes them play better and that makes them better inform the production. Uh, I'm really big on getting good sounds for the performer in the moment that they're performing. Um, it, it informs their performance in a way that I think is very important to the outcome. And I want, <clears throat> I want to be building the production on sounds that are going to be there at the end they yeah, are going yeah, to be totally. drastically changed at the end because how am i supposed to know how to dial up this guitar overdub if the drums and bass are going to sound really different in the mix you know or you know that's just an example but i want to know and i and i and i'm pretty aggressive in the moment of recording and i'm not afraid to overdo something and have to redo it as opposed to just playing it safe all the time yeah. Well, um, you know, when you talked about the moment of inception, I guess that's it. It's like the beginning of that song, making sure that you've you've already got this illusion of what this song is going to, you know, how it's going to transport you into this space and and this emotion right from the get-go, not not waiting for later on as if you're going to, you know, that the waiting for later on is sort of part of that fix it in the mix mentality that we learn to stop thinking, you know, and, and start thinking about getting it right at the start. Yeah. And I think that developed as more options became available that the onset of, you know, it's like, if you have 16 tracks, you're going to really commit to sounds, <laughs> you know, and if you can't have automation, you're going to really commit to sounds. Yeah. And there's something to be said for that. I mean, I'm a big fan of, of older records. I listen to a lot of stuff from the 60s and the 70s, and I'm just constantly amazed at how great the sounds and performances are on those things, even compared to stuff today. You know, you put some of that stuff up and it's just so good sonically. Mm -hmm. And you just, it's, I scratch my head and go, man, you know, it seems like that th we should have come farther to the point where like the productions today would be on some, you know, better level sonically, but they're really not. They're, they're really not. I, I, I usually prefer the sound of older records, to be honest. Maybe our art is too boundless these days. You know, there's like not enough limitations and rules for us to have to follow and, and push up against. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. So, so what are some of the ways then that you, um, are there any, you know, tricks or advice or techniques that are helpful as far as making sure that you do capture that, that, just right illusion at the moment of inception? Um, I think I think you have to be honest with yourself about what you're hearing 
and be willing to keep working until you really have what you want. It's really easy to under the pressure of, uh, of, you know, four or five musicians in the room and everybody wants to get going and, and just play. And sometimes it just takes a little bit to get the sound right. And I think you have to resist the urge to settle for, yeah, that's pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and push it until you're like, I love the way all this sounds, you know, I love the way every element of this sounds now. Yeah. And, and that takes us a, a drive and a desire and a just gumption, you know, and some days it's harder than others. Some days you're really inspired and some days you're just going for it and you just, you know, and it works. And then some days you really got to push through it, you know, these things just aren't cooperating and for whatever reason, you're just not hearing what you want to hear. And you have to just have that mentality. Like, I'm not going to stop until the band either says, okay, no more, or I feel like it sounds great. You know, I want to say, add to that, that it also takes a group mentality. So you don't want to be, um, who was the, who was the, the, um, tyrant captain, uh, in Moby Dick, you know, who's like making everybody continue on, um, despite it, nobody else wanting to do it. Um, you want to, I'm reminded to invite the band in to listen, because that's a great way to get, you know, as a group, get yourselves all on the same page about like, we're not quite there or we are quite there, you know, or somebody else is hearing stuff that you weren't thinking about as far as getting it just right. Yeah. I mean, playback is a production tool. You know, you, if you, if the band is out there and they're like, come on, we want to, you know, do something. You just say, hey, well, come listen to it. And usually the band, if you're sitting there saying, yeah, this isn't quite right, then they're able to hone in on it and say, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe we should work on that a little more. Maybe that snare drum doesn't doesn't quite do it you know maybe we need a better that's the backbeat on the whole on the whole song we need that to be right yeah totally um well so let me ask you one more question and we'll take a break um tell us about a little bit more about your studio the drake so now this is not like uh, the drake hotel downtown in chicago where i once um, tripped on too many mushrooms and found myself mesmerized by the string quartet that was playing in the lobby <laughs> I love that. I <laughs> once got a, drunk yeah. uh, next to Vince Vaughn and um, what's the guy who's uh, the, uh, the King of Queens uh, at the Drake Hotel. It's a it's a it's a place where strange things happen. Um, but actually, Indeed. quick little side story: somebody actually recently went to the Drake Hotel because the art the client had told the artist, "Oh, it's at the Drake Studio," and they just assumed that it was at the Drake Hotel. And they oh, just that's went, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> True story. Uh, I bet I'm they had a fancy brunch instead of recording. <laughs> so what, um, tell us a little bit more about your studio. Right, right. Um, so my studio is, I own a three-flat building here in Chicago in Logan Square. And the second floor is mostly my studio. It is basically, there is a... Um, I'm looking at it right now. My control room is the living room. Uh, one of the tracking rooms is the dining room. One of the other tracking rooms is the master bedroom. And I have my plate and my spring reverb and my Leslie and some other things in the other bedroom. So it's cool. compact, but uh, I got enough room to do a lot of things I want to do. I've got some nice instruments here. I've got a, a, a piano and a Wurlitzer and a lot of guitars. And um, I have a, a, an API, it's called API the Box console. And then I have 12 more API mic preamps. So that's like kind of the core of my front end. And then I recently got these really cool things. I met this, um, this guy, Steve Butterworth is his name. And he's an ex-Neve engineer who now lives in Spain. And I kind of nice. befriended him on the internet. And he builds these, he bought all the old Neve parts and stock when the Melbourne factory closed. He bought all the transformers and all the 1073 modules that they still had. And he's got like four consoles and he's got all these components and he builds these things called past EQs. And it's essentially like a, a 1081 or a, a, a 31105 um, mic pre EQ. And I got a pair of them and they're just wonderful. And so <laughs> you can actually go back in the past and like get capture that take that you missed? <laughs> I just I turn wish. the knob and it goes back. <laughs> I great. wish, I wish. But they are making the current takes uh, all, the, all the sweeter. So I've got a good, you know, analog front end. I've got a bunch of outboard gear, got some Yuri compressors, 
and some like Lang EQs and a GML. And, and um, I, I got an EMT 140 that I use nice. religiously. What, what was the EQ? You said a Lime EQ? Uh, Lang, the oh, Lang, Lang EQ right. too. Okay. Yeah, I've got a pair of those. I do quite a bit of mastering. And so um, I use the Langs and a GML and a Manly Very Mu and sometimes a Smart C1. When I do nice. Mastering. Um, so a couple of quick questions about some of your gear. Um, one, you you quickly mentioned a spring uh, I think for maybe a lot of the rock stars, uh, a spring reverb might be something you think about either as a plug-in or as a uh, you know a little spring tank in the back of your amp. But I'm guessing you're talking about one of these big towers or something like that. Is that right? It's not a tower, actually. It's just a one-rack space unit. It's called a Demeter. Oh, uh, oh right, right. Demeter. Real yeah, I, didn't, spring I forgot reverb. they made this. There's two springs in it. There's a long one and a short one. And I don't like the short one, so I just use the long one. Um, and I use it subtly, but frequently. It's great to just, that and the EMT together do a really cool thing because the EMT is kind of stereo and lush and wide and big. And the the Demeter is like boingy and kind of distorty sometimes when you hit it hard. And, and, and it's mono. And so you can, you know, I use it to just like, if something just needs a little bit more reverb and the plate's not, more plate isn't the trick. Sometimes if you just put a little spring in there, it kind of just rounds it out. I, I do that a lot. I also use this thing called a full tone tube tape echo a lot. I love that thing. Oh yeah. Those are, they're, they're great. The um, full tone basically started remaking the echo plex years ago. Yeah. It's like a tube echo plex is, is what it is. And it's really just, nice. it does all the, yeah, it does all this cool feedbacky delay. It does a cool slap delay, but it's just, there's something about the sound of that little box and running stuff through. I love to track guitars like through it into the Leslie, you know, and it's got this great tube circuit in it that you can kind of break up. And it's just, it's just a really good complement to the digital world, in my opinion, because it's like the opposite of digital you know, in every way. And I know that they make plugins to emulate Echoplexes like that. But the plugins just never really do the same thing. It's that same. It's still that thing with knobs and like dialing it in by hand, and the way it's very imperfect that I think makes a real tape echoplex or a full tone like that sound so great and so useful in a in a track or a mix. I would say that the tape echo of all the pieces of equipment I have is the one that having being able to physically manipulate real knobs in analog time is the most important. Yeah, because. What I'll do a lot of times is when I'm mixing, I'll print, you know, like the vocal might have three different delay passes on it that I just print through the tube tape echo. You know, one might be a slap, one might be a ringy thing, or one might just be, you know, triggering feedback on a note here and there, you know. But one thing that I do all the time is I manipulate it in real time as I'm printing the track back in. So a lot of my vocal delays are just kind of tailored to the performance and the part as opposed to just like setting it and letting it run through the thing the whole time. Yeah. Um, so there's also another piece of gear you mentioned, the Whirly, the Whirlitzer. Uh, that's one of those things when I first started getting into recording studios, I kind of didn't know anything about it. And then I quickly realized that it's such a useful band slash songwriter tool. You know, it's the Wurlitzer um, is maybe you could explain to the rock stars a little bit more uh, in case they don't, haven't seen a physical one. What is a Whirly and um, wh what do you use it for? I'm looking at mine right now. It is literally 20 feet away from me in the control room. Um, a Wurlitzer is an electric piano. I liken it to an electric guitar because that's kind of what it's most like in that there are strings and pickups. Um, it's a small scale uh electric piano sounds somewhat similar to a Rhodes, a Fender Rhodes. It's a little different. Not, it's a not little, quite as clean, right? It's a little growlier. It's barkier. Yeah. It's growlier and barkier and it doesn't go as low. And the vibrato is a little different. Um, it's got a mellow tone until you dig into it, but it's very responsive to how your fingers hit it. You can get a lot of different sound in a way that you can like it with a guitar, an acoustic guitar, or an electric guitar. It's like how hard you hit it really changes the sound of it. Um, yeah. It's expressive. Yeah, and the and one it's got I have, that great tremolo. Yes, the tremolo is wonderful, and the one I have is is not like anyone I bet you've ever seen, Lidge, because it's a super rare one. It it's built into a, a spinet piano case, like a miniaturized spinet piano case, like a, an old mm -hmm. Wurlitzer shorty top. So it's built into that, and then it's got a big like I think it's a 
10 inch speaker kind of in the middle down by where the pedals are and it's a case and then the amp is sits down on the bottom in the back but it just it sounds so good in the room and you can just sit at, I just leave it on all the time when people are here and I can't tell you how many times like when we're doing harmony vocals or trying to figure out a chord change in a you know the somebody can just walk over to that and just go uh, and there it is and it's a cool vibey sound under your hands and it's it's right there in the room it's immediate it's got a sound and um I find it probably most useful in that regard I do record it when somebody wants to record a Wurlitzer but it's also got a cool feature that I believe Mark Rubel installed on it when he was once in possession of it, which is a switch that turns the speaker off. So if you're recording in the room with something else and you don't want bleed, you can make it just be a DI. Uh, that's cool. That's smart. Mm -hmm. um, so it does make me wonder, the, the Whirly has been such a useful instrument in studios for my entire recording career. And yet I've never... I'm not aware of anybody who's ever rebuilt and, you know, sort of reissued the Whirly. It, is, it moved into the plug-in world, but is there anybody, any company that does, you know, remakes or reissues of it that people should know about that I just don't know? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, I feel like it's sort of like tape machines in a way in that there's like enough carcasses out there that can be revived <laughs> to sort of service the market for it, does, yeah, you know? Probably, yeah. um, and I feel like it's just probably not cost effective to tool up, to build something. It's a very, there's just a lot of moving parts, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And for what you'd have to sell it for to make a new one, I, I don't know if people would be able to get it because then they'd just say, well, I'll buy a used one and have somebody fix it up for 500 bucks or something. Right know? on. Well, let's take a break for a sec. Rockstar's um, you can find stuff we're talking about in the show notes on your iPhone, uh, your Android, your listening device, or just your phone. If you're on your desktop, just go to rsrockstars.com, search for Anthony Gravino, Gravino excuse me, and uh, it'll take you right to the blog post where, of course, I have a YouTube um, player that and, uh, and links to Anthony's website. Anthony actually has a beautiful website, which I'll ask you about in a minute, and uh, a great music player on there too. So we'll try and include that in the blog post. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitar is recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is go directly to MixMasterBundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, Rockstars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars! We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Anthony Gravino, joining us from Chicago, Illinois, out of his private studio, The Drake. Very cool place. And uh, we're going to jump in and uh, ask some more questions about making records. You ready to jam? I'm ready to jam. All right, dude. So I mentioned a moment ago that you have a really cool website. Really gorgeous. It's it's very simple. You've got sort of graphic line drawings, cartoon style all over. It's all just black and white. Um, I wanted to one ask you know how did you do that, and what advice do you have for the rock stars about the importance of creating a cool website? So that website, all those images on that website were drawn by Bunny Patuti. Uh, he's a great cartoonist, and right on. I've been working with him for years. He's one of the first people. I ever recorded with. And through the years, he has this habit of sort of just doodling in the studio and he'll just leave little 
little nuggets around the studio of fun little drawings that sometimes yeah. pertain to the session and are often sarcastic and funny in a really clever way. So I had always thought, oh, I just love his style. We should somehow figure out a way to incorporate that into the music or the, you know, something. Somehow that should be used. <laughs> and I had this kind of lame sort of very... Uh, half-assed, I would call it, website for the longest time. And I just didn't really think, care about it. And I had, you know, people say, oh, your website, I, you know, not so great, da 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 So finally I was like, you know what, I'm going to try to get Michael to draw, Bunny's name is Michael, his real name, uh, to, to draw some images for me. And I'm just going to design the website around his drawings. And so that's what I did. And I just came up with a sort of concept for every page and then told him the concept and just let him make two or three drawings. And then I picked the one that I liked and we used nice. that. And then actually we took it a step further and we made a whole stop animation video uh, for a song of his that I played on and recorded and mixed and mastered. And um, it's called All in One. Yeah, I think we put the link in the YouTube playlist to that. Yeah, and that was fun. That was the first video that that was like my concept. And we... Spent a lot of time and a lot of effort because I didn't know how to make a video and neither did he. And we made a video and it was really fun. And I love the way his artwork can be so evocative. Yeah. So that was that was the core of the site. And then I just wanted it to be, um, I, I just remember this quote, uh, I was watching a, a documentary about Pink Floyd and they were talking about album covers. And I kind of liken websites to album covers. You know, they're kind of a visual representation of what your art is in a way. Yeah. For for engineers at least. And so I and and I think it was Rick Wright was saying, you know, the one thing that the band told uh the artist was we wanted it to be simple and bold. And I just that really resonated with me. And I wanted my website to have that same characteristic. I wanted it to be simple and bold. By the way, which one's pink anyway? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think it's waters. <laughs> um, th well, that's cool, man. You know, another thing is you had a great music player on there as part of that. Um, what? How did you do that? What kind of, you know, we're all used to YouTube and, and Spotify and stuff, but here you had this really nice, simple, custom way of playing tracks back directly on your website. Uh, yeah, I have to credit my web designer, Jules Hansen, for that. Uh, Jules Henson, I'm sorry. Um, she worked with me. I told her that audio quality was um, important and that I wanted it to be as good as it could be and that I didn't want it to look like it was just some cheap embedded player on, on there. You know, I wanted it to look um, unique and I wanted it to look like it was part of the site. I didn't want it to look like somebody just like, downloaded some player and clunked it in there. You know, I wanted it yeah. to be to totally integrated as much as it could be with the drawings. And there's a, I really love the drawing that Michael did for, for the music page. I think that's a big part of it. You know, he just did this crazy cool little thing like he always does. And, um, and she did a great job of, of making it work and making it look good on different devices. Uh, I mean, I could have never done that. And we worked very hard. Okay, so so maybe that's part of the advice there is, um, you know, in order to have sort of a custom website, it's still smart to find somebody who's particularly good at that kind of web design and just work with them. Yeah, and she's she was recommended to me by a friend. She's a singer. She, you know, she she's very artistic and and sensitive person, and I think she was very uh, receptive to my ideas, which were probably counterintuitive to what a lot of her clients would want because. My whole idea was that but I have this theory that the internet, one of the bad things that it's done is it's like taken the mystery out of everything. Yeah. And that, and that there used to be something really cool about kind of not knowing all the details, not knowing like, you know, what every pore on a person's face looks like. Um, so I wanted the site to be sort of mysterious in a way. And she, that, that's not what most people want. Most people want to be like, here's me, here's what I do. Here's me talking about me. You know, that, that's kind of the, seems like it's more yeah. the thing. And I, I didn't, I had to explain to her that my website was less about trying to sort of overtly sell something and more about trying to be an, 
artistic extension of how I, you know, what my artistic sort of um, vibe is. Well, know? let me move forward to, you know, challenge, a more challenging question. If you don't want your website to overtly sell things, you still want to have, you know, successful functioning studio as a business. Um, so how do you go about finding clients for your studio there? Um, and what advice do you have for the rock stars as far as doing that? And even, you know, a tough one, which is just like, how how should people go about thinking about setting their rates for their studios? Um, well, at this point, I, I would say I don't really go out and look for clients anymore. Um, mostly they find me these days. Uh, and that was not the case for a good many years. I think that the thing that I did, there, there were two things that I basically did. One was I was I went to shows and uh, I talked to musicians that I thought were good, and I tried to more just befriend them and and talk to them about music, not so much recording, but just to kind of get a feel and to meet people and get my name out there in the circles. I did a lot of that when I first started, uh, and then you know the other thing is is it's just you have to kind of pick your battles because you can get lost in this like social media game and you can, you know, there's just so much of that out there. And I think that the real thing to do is to try to, you know, if you see a, an artist that you're like, I really want to work with them and you're not established, then say, Hey, look, let's do a song together. I did that so many times with so many artists. And I was so, I was very glad that I did it most of the time, you know, let's just get together and do a song, no money, just you and me, let's make some art. And let's see what it's like to work together. Yeah. And I will still do that. If I see somebody who doesn't know me from a hole in the ground and, and, and I think they're amazing, I will still approach them and say, here, let me just mix this, this song for you and you just hear what it sounds like. I don't want any money for it. I'm just going to show you. Or let me, you know, let's, let's get together and record for a day. Um, I think that's still applicable for me. Now, some big name guys or a lot of people would probably just say, well, I would never do that. But I usually well, I think in something. Nashville that exists around the writing aspect too. I think people get together and do that sort of thing all the time. To, but it's part of a co-writing process as well. Sure, sure. And you know, it's just uh, that's just I've always been a kind of I come from a musician standpoint less so than like an engineer or studio owner or anything like that. So I'm always interested in that end of it first, and I try to pursue. I, I feel like if you get if you get comfortable with somebody on a musical level, it's a lot easier than to approach them about working on something from as an engineer. Yeah. Well, you mentioned um, owning a building there with three floors on it. I, I, that seems like a very Chicago thing to do. I have another friend there who's got a, a building that I think also had three floors on it. And you know, I, I learned that there was a, an approach that says like, you know, you you get a space and then you can rent a couple of other parts of the property and that can help, you know, make this thing work that you're doing. Um, he was an artist, for example. And, um, you know, even for myself living here in Nashville, I, I built a home studio, but then I would rent the upstairs of my house to a roommate so that that helped defray that. Um, do you have any thoughts you want to share with people about, you know, the importance of maybe just sort of balancing, um, you know, the finance of your life and everything to allow for studios and, and creating, you know, having an artistic approach to things? Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that you face when you first get into it is where do I do this? Where can I feel comfortable doing this? And how am I going to make it work financially? Um, this place is a very unique place. It's just, you know, I bought it with some partners and we've had it and now it's just me and one other guy. And, uh, you know, we both do music. We both kind of work around each other's schedules sometimes because there's definitely a little bit of bleed between the places. Some stuff gets really loud. Um, mm -hmm. But we also work on a lot of stuff together. Uh, and so I think that if you can, one thing I would say, advice I would say, is if you can get control, like ownership of a property, you're in a way better position because I've had a lot of people that I know just have so many problems with trying to have studios in places that they rent where they don't get a long enough lease. And then you spend all this time and effort and, and money getting the place so that it works. And the next thing you know, the landlord decides to sell the building or mm -hmm. you know they're gonna raise the rent past what you can afford. 
and then you've got to move. And in this business, it is not good to have to move. <laughs> it is yeah. bad. Yeah, it exactly. is very expensive. It is it is annoying. It just kills, takes so much energy. Um, so try to find a space that if you're going to pursue it long term, try to find a place that you know you can do it there for a while. Yeah, I feel like with recording studios, you really have to grow into a space too. Yeah, you want to leave a little space to grow if you can, for sure. Because, you know, you never know what's going to happen. If things go right, you'll probably need more space. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to, like, perfectly design it at the get-go and then not change anything as you go. I find it's I tend to change things and keep adding little bits and pieces and changing the design and the layout a little bit. I mean, not so much the layout with rooms, but, you know, room treatments and things like that. And then also, you know... To to completely build out a studio and move into a you know an empty shell, that's a, that's huge. You know, it's a massive expense and and effort. And you're absolutely right. I think that um, having a home studio is one of the most reasonable ways to be able to work in a space and survive and be able to do it long term. Yeah, I would not have been able to do what I've been doing for the last you know twelve years of doing this if I wasn't able to do this in my home, you know, it, it was absolutely essential to it. And I'm just, I feel fortunate to have, you know, gotten into this situation and to been able to make music here for this long. And, um, you know, people here are really supportive of that. People here are very DIY. Musicians here are not afraid to come into a non-traditional space and record if they know that you can get good results, you know. Um, and I've done enough records here now where people can go listen to the stuff that's done here and hear that, you know, it sounds like a record. It doesn't sound like yeah. it was done in a little flat, you know? And it's amazing what you can do. And I found little things about this building that I would miss dearly <laughs> if I left. There's this like um, wooden hallway stairwell here that's sort of right outside where my where I usually cut drums. And if you just crack the door open a little bit, and I usually put like this stereo Neumann mic out there when the drummer's playing, the ambient sound is just, it's amazing. I love it. I, you know, I don't know, I can't get it anywhere else. And I, sometimes when I record at a bigger studio, I'm like, these drums sound great. I just wish I had my hallway on it, you know, and, and <laughs> I need to rig up a way to like pump the drums into a speaker out there or something so that I can recreate that. Um, yeah. Send it over the internet and, and feed it back in. Yeah. 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 Um, and there's also this set of poles, these wooden poles out there that we discovered if you hit them with mallets, they all have pitches and they all have this interesting resonance and you can play it like an instrument. So it's like an instrument built into the, Very the cool. stairwell. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the records you've done. All in One by Bunny Patuti. Super cool throwback pop song with a great pulsing piano in there. Um, and then you also talked about recording a lot of jazz and that triggered a, a question for me about recording piano. So I've been doing some jazz stuff and I've been struck by how challenging it can be to record acoustic piano well, especially for jazz stuff with a lot of dynamic range in the recording um, and get it great. And I wondered if you wanted to just talk about all the different ways that you found it useful to record piano and how you like to do it. Well, um, you know, when you're talking about jazz and piano, it's definitely a different animal because a lot of times you have other things in the room with it and then you get bleed. Um, that to me is very, very challenging dealing with a loud drum set in a room with a mic'd up acoustic piano, not because it's hard to get the piano to sound good, but it's because it's hard to get the drum sound good because of how they sound in the piano mics. Um, are you uh, often recording an upright or a, a I, my piano is an upright. Yes. So I, what I have here, I have kind of just a, it's just always set up this way. I have a, a, this young Chang upright piano. It's in this kind of dead room that is also sort of my vocal overdub room. Um, and Behind it, I have two uh, old uh, AKG 451 EBs on a stereo bar, and they just live back there. That's their only purpose in life. Nice. And it's a, it's a cool, it just sounds cool. I don't know why it's, it's dampened back there, but the mics are kind of bright and the piano is kind of dark, and they just complement each other for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that that sound is very versatile in pretty much any kind of production track that I'm trying to do where it's not 
necessarily a piano feature, but it's just part of a track. I love that piano for that. But, you know, most of the jazz guys want to play uh, big grand pianos, you know, that are inspiring to play and that light up a room. And so, you know, when I go into s- studios where the, you know, I'm tracking a grand piano, it's, it's actually a lot harder to get that. Um, yeah. I, I find making a grand piano is pretty challenging. Lately, what I've been doing is, is I've got these two stereo mics. One is called a Neumann SM69 FET. And the other one is a Royer SF12. And I look at them as sort of like yin and yang. Um, the Royer is kind of dark and the Neumann is more open and bright. And so depending on what the piano, I'm a, I'm a big like opposites attract kind of thing. So if it's like a bright piano, I want a darker mic. If it's a dark piano, I want a brighter mic. Mm-hmm. So I usually use end up using one of those two mics. And I also find that just like the phase of whatever bleed is happening in the room is always pretty good in a stereo mic. Whereas sometimes with spaced mics, it's kind of weird. Right. Um, so, and I'm just, I, I really have in the last couple of years come around on, on using stereo microphones since I got the, the Neumann and the Royer because they're, re- first of all, they're, they're really nice stereo mics. Um, but they just solve a lot of problems quickly with, with phase, you know, when you're trying to use stereo configurations, it's just really easy to chase your tail for a long time. Like, ah, these mics are still kind of out of phase. How do I get them to, to play nice, you know? Yeah. What are some ways that you are quickly aware of them being out of phase? Is it just sort of you're, you've trained your ear to know that it just doesn't, it sounds funny, or do you pop the mix into mono and hear something funny going on with the, with the stereo? I usually have, I can hear something is wrong and then I'll maybe flip the phase on one channel, see what happens. You know, if it's not, if it sounds like it's out of phase, then maybe I'll flip it into mono. And I'm not a big flip it into mono guy, personally. I don't do that all that much. I'll, I'll do it occasionally. But okay. um, if I'm really questioning myself, I'll look at a phase meter. <laughs> but that's even more rare than flipping it into mono. Yeah. It's just kind of an instinct for me. I can just kind of tell when the low end is blurring and getting kind of canceled and I'm hearing comb filtering. I'm pretty sensitive to that. And my monitors tend to really you know, you can hear when something's out of phase and then pretty easily. What are the monitors that you use? I don't think you mentioned that yet. Oh, those are, they're SE eggs. SE eggs. I don't know anything about those. They're, they used, well, I don't think SE makes them anymore. Mine are from SE electronics, which also makes microphones. And they partnered with this guy named Andy Monroe and they built these speakers. Um, is, am, am I remembering this right? Am I, or am I, do I have this wrong that SC is also with Rupert Neve? Is that the same? Yeah, yeah. Same and John, and John, John Pines, Pines is, yeah. he's the one who hit me to the SCs. And I remember I went into his studio. To, to, he was mastering a record that I had cut. And, you know, he'd mastered a bunch of stuff that I'd done. And he, we always used the Genelex down there. And then at the time I had, I think, Adam A7s. This was probably like 10 years ago. And um we were, he's, he had these, the new eggs, they'd just come out and he had them in the studio and, you know, AB and we, I remember AB and him with the general, like, I think it was like the 8032s or whatever the one that everybody had, the 8031. And the eggs just were just so much more revealing. <laughs> I was, I was shocked. I was just like, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. Cause I always felt like the general X were pretty good and the eggs just, I hear, heard things that I just couldn't hear in the Genelex. Yeah, you know, I think about. that's really valuable. You you yeah. you want speakers to reveal the things that you need to fix. Yeah, and the eggs are are not forgiving. Uh, I, clients will listen in them and just be like, "God, it sounds way better at home." Sometimes, you know. <laughs> Interesting. And, and, and I'm like, "Well, that's actually what you want." You know, I mean, it's just. It's, you want it to translate on every system, you know, and the eggs will just really show you when something is wrong. And that's what I like about them. Yeah. They make you work to get it to sound good, but they're pretty accurate. I mean, they have their anomalies just like every speaker does. And you got to, I think one of the most important things is just knowing what your speakers do. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I've been using them for like seven or eight years now, and I just really know them. They're very familiar. I have a second set of them for if I have to go other places and I don't have monitors that I want to listen to. I just bring my own and just set them up. I think that's one of the things that's frustrating for me is if I take a recording into some other space, for me, it's, it's often just the car. You know, if I take a recording to the car and the car reveals something that the studio monitors didn't, then I get pissed off. You know, I'm like, 
why can't that just be revealed to me when I'm mixing it, you know? But um, right. but I guess that's a little bit of the process of of checking your mix everywhere you go to and as you dial it in. Um, but let me let me come back to piano for a sec. So you found that a stereo mic helps focus things. Um, what about you know a grand piano you're recording? Is it usually in a space where there's plenty of space around it to the walls, or do you find you sometimes you're in spaces where there are some walls nearby? And then do you do you like to um, open the lid all the way? Do you remove the lid? Do you have any any tips regarding that? Well, if I'm recording the piano in a nice room by itself, I think I would prefer to have the lid off most of the time. Um, but if I'm in a small room that doesn't sound good, or if I'm in, if I'm cutting with a band live and I, there's going to be bleed, I'm going to be like closing, keeping the lid as closed as I can and putting a blanket over it, you know, just to try, I'm just like trying to keep the other sounds out. Now, how do you um, get the mic in there? Would you sort of put the mic in? Par- yeah. And then lower the lid the- as, as low as you can go and then kind of go over the mics with the big blanket of some kind. You know, that's what I do. I work at this place called Shirk Studios quite a bit and he's got a, a C7 and a Yamaha C7. And we, you know, usually there's some sort of just like baffling blanketing. We put baffles, I put it up against the wall and then I put a baffle behind it and then I put a blanket over the, you know, thing. And I'm just, I just, you know, it's, uh, the bleed is usually the bigger problem. Mm-hmm. And you, um, but I really like recording grand piano in a nice room with the lid off because then you can just like balance this, how far the mics are from the hammers. And especially with the figure eight ribbon, you know, and you can just kind of like pull the mic up and just like bring the room in or bring the room out, you know? Yeah. And have you, when you're doing an acoustic, uh, I mean, excuse me, when you're doing a stereo mic, have you ever found, you know, I remember listening to Chick Corea records and being struck by when you listened to them, it felt like you heard a, a full stereo spectrum from left to right, um, which maybe is a bunch of bullshit because I'm not sure if the piano really sounds that way anyway or not. <laughs> but have you ever found that that you are able to record it in such a way that that stereo image of the piano having, a you know, a kind of a left where the low frequencies are and a right, if it's pianist perspective, and the right is the is the high frequencies on the right that that can happen or is even important to you at all? Yeah, I like that, um, and I do it that way too. I do a pianist perspective always. That's just my that's just how I hear it, um, and I do that quite a bit. I mean, um, I feel like especially if I'm doing like a trio jazz record or something, you know, upright drums, piano. Uh, <laughs> I like for the piano to feel wide and, and somehow if sometimes if you get it right, you can almost create like a, like a 3d, like a depth. It almost gives you the illusion of like front to back information. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that. I love having the the bass be a little bit in the left side. And then, and then like the low end doesn't compete as much with the bass as up the middle, you know, and then, and then the right hand over to the right, it's got a place to speak, you know, when, when there's a solo or something like that, it kind of, as opposed to it seeming more like mono-ish. Well, so if you had sort of the ideal setup for doing what you just described, what would that look like? Where where would the walls be on this particular piano? Would the lid be off? Where would you put your, would you, let's say you were using your um, your SM69 FET mic, um, where would you be putting that mic to, to arrive at something like that? Well, I, I mean, that's a, that's so situational. Um, <clears throat> you know, if I'm just going for a glorious piano sound, let's say, you know, like a beautiful, pure classical piano, mm-hmm. I mean, you gotta have, I gotta have some context. So that, let's say it's that, um, I would probably start with the, uh, depending, well, let's say if it was a Steinway, which would probably be like an A or a B, mm-hmm. which would probably be one of the more ideal pianos to record. I'd probably use the Neumann cause it's a darker piano, um, I would probably put it over the hammers so that one side was sort of facing the the left hammers and one side was more towards the right. I'd move it around and try to get those two sides balanced with the gain even so that the mic was capturing the balanced sound as opposed to like making up for the left being a lot louder than the right with a gain knob. Right. I would try to do that with mic placement. 
And um, also just listening for proximity effect, like how much low end do I want to have the piano to have? Might bring it down a little if I want more low end or more attack. Um, and just 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 for people to visualize what equals down when you talk about bringing it down, are you talking about like six inches from above the piano, uh, the the hammers, or are you talking about like two feet above the the hammers? What in your mind equals kind of getting into the proximity range potentially? I would say like ten to fifteen inches. I would. I don't know. Maybe even closer. It's hard for me to visualize uh, length like that. Yeah, pretty, no, no, pretty no. close. Pretty close. Not. You know, I'm not afraid to get it close and see what it sounds like. Yeah. And sometimes it's not right. You know. And and the, another thing I do a lot on a on a grand piano is like down at the the end of the piano, not where the player is, but the other end. There's there's like this bass chamber on a lot of them that just this hole that like shoots out a lot of low end, and. I like to put a mic down there if I'm looking for like a big sound. And that's, we're talking about the sound hole that is part of the harp uh, above the soundboard. So you see it when Cor- you lift the lid up. Correct. There was a, yeah, and then, there was oh, a, I'm sorry, one more thing. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the, the other thing is, is that, you know, if, if it's by itself and I can put up a room mic or two, that's great too, you know, because then I probably won't need to use reverb on it. And I can just use the room sound, assuming it's a good room. You yeah. said ideal situation. So yeah. I'm in, in my ideal situation, I'm in a good sounding room. <laughs> totally. Uh, so yeah, that too. Room mics are always helpful in those kinds of situations. Well, I think that, you know, that I think most of us are recording in not ideal spaces and we're always trying to do stuff. But sometimes the struggle is every once in a while we get an opportunity to do something like record a classical piano or a, a jazz ensemble. And all of a sudden we're like, Oh man, I really need to sound like this sounds amazing and you know if it doesn't it's my fault not the situation. So that's why it's so great to be able to talk about these things and sort of really have a sense of, you know, what are some things that might work for that. Um let's jump over to the bass, the upright bass. That I find can be a very challenging instrument to record, especially when you want it to be a great jazz recording. Um you know, the kind that you want to listen back to on a very super expensive hi-fi and have it sound amazing where you're like, let's just listen to the detail of the fingers on that string. You know, what, what sort of stuff would you like to talk about as far as, you know, how you like to record an upright, again, kind of an ideal situation where you're really getting what you think is a fantastic recording of it. Yeah. Upright bass is in my opinion, the hardest instrument to capture that I have recorded (laughs) and I've recorded a lot of it. And, uh, it's just a cantankerous s- instrument that that changes so dramatically from register to register. Yeah. And makes a lot of incidental, annoying, loud <laughs> sounds. <laughs> I've spent so much time trying to make upright bass sound good. Uh, Me too. S- yeah, it's just, it's and kind it of al- the bane. It of always gets existence. stuck in like the kitchen or the closet on a session where you're trying to isolate it too. Exactly. Yes. I've rec- had many booth upright bass recordings. Um, so in my ideal world, one thing that I am, have learned over the years that I'm fairly adamant about with upright bass that most people will probably disagree with me on is I only want to use one mic on it. I want one mic. I don't want a DI. I don't like the way that sounds. I want one really good, well-placed microphone on the bass. And usually that is a KM84, a Neumann KM84. Um, Occasionally a U87. I have an old U87 that sounds nice on upright bass. Um, And the 84, I I forgot, is that a large diaphragm or a small? It's a small diaphragm condenser. It's a pencil condenser. It's a, yeah, it's a great, great microphone. One of my favorite microphones. So good on acoustic guitar. Good on anything. I mean, KM86s and KM84s, it's just like, those are just record making mics. I mean, you just move them around the room, get them close to something that sounds good. And it sounds great. Nice. Yeah. I love those. So I use a KM84 usually is what I go for. Although I, you know, I, this is funny. I was in my buddy's studio the other day and he was playing me some acoustic jazz that he'd recorded and the bass sound really good. And he said he used a Bayer M160, which is a mic I really like. And it's ribbon. And it's a ribbon, and I have a couple of them. And what blew my mind was it was trio in the room live together. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was quartet live in the room. It was bass, drums, uh, like Wurlitzer, and electric guitar. 
And the bass, he, she's like, the drums were here and the bass was here. And they weren't that far apart. They weren't super close, but they weren't that far apart. And when I soloed up the bass mic, it had such good off-axis rejection of the drums. It was amazing. Hmm. It was so isolated and it sounded balanced and nice. And I was just like, I should try that. I should try M160 on the bass sometimes. So I'm, it, it's so hard to capture upright bass. I am constantly trying things to improve my game at it because yeah. I feel like it's something that I've still can't quite put my finger on. <laughs> I've had to jump through some serious hoops. Um, I remember doing a, a jazz ensemble and I was having trouble getting a sound on the upright bass and there wasn't, you know, a, a way to, oh, we were also doing no headphones. So the bass That player, helps. That actually helps because then the drummer doesn't play as loud. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, in this case, <laughs> really you still heard everything else through the bass mic. I even took my pencil mic and I went right up to the fingers on the strings, like literally like a half an inch from the fingers and listened to that. And I still couldn't hear the bass. And I was just like, right. oh, all right, I got a real problem here. And in that now, case- wait, what, what do you use? I want to know what you use. Well, I mean, I, I try all kinds of things too. I agree that one um, mic is wonderful. I've had great success with a- um, a 451, AKG 451, looking up the fretboard in the past. And and then I think I put a 414 as well in the F hole. Um, and that was with a bass player here, Dave Jakes, who plays with John Prine all the time. And, oh, um, wow. and it was his recommendation and, and it sounded great, but there was, the room was super dead and down and there was hardly anything else going on. So it wasn't competing. Right. Um, the, the real challenge for me is if there's any kind of real drums playing, uh, you know, having the bass in the same studio is too close to the drums. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it's, you know, one thing that I, I, so I used to think, okay, if the bass has to be in the room with the drums, the further away from the drums I get it, the better. I think the exact opposite now. I think you got to get it close. It has to be baffled, but close so that the bleed isn't distant bleed. Mm -hmm. It's like tighter bleed, you know? And then you can just use the bleed to kind of sculpt the drum sound. Whereas if you've got it like on the other side of a big studio room and the drums are just getting in there enough to where you really hear them, but they're like, you know, there's like a 200 second millisecond delay on them or something, you know, because yeah. they're all the way across the room. You know, then it's just like, okay, this is, I can't use the, the drums just sound too roomy and I can't get away from it and still hear the bass, you know? So I've found lately, if I have to have them in the same room, I actually want the bass closer to the drums and then baffled as opposed to far away and baffled. Well, thinking about it like that, you know, if the drums are close to the bass but baffled, that means the drums, you know, are the, the baffle is sort of blocking the drums from going right into the bass mic on some level. And, and if you're going to hear some kind of effect of the room, it's now twice as far to the wall and back again to get into the bass. So it's almost as if, you know, it's really far away, which would make the, the reflections quieter, hopefully. Right, exactly. And this is just like, there's, I've had so much trial and error with this. I, I can't, I'm glad you asked that question because I need to personally grapple with it regularly. You know, I mean, we, we all come from a background of sort of rock and roll and things. I grew up listening to jazz and always loved it. Um, and I don't do it regularly, but when I do, I do it lovingly. Like, and I, it really is important to me to make it sound fan, as fantastic as the jazz that I love. And so... I find it's it's quite a challenge, you know, getting all these instruments to really sound beautiful and not sound like, you know, some treated, funky, cool rock band version of it, but actually sound like a hi-fi recording of piano, bass, drums. And I don't mean hi-fi meaning clinical. I just mean like beautiful sounding, like, you know, the old- Yeah, like a Rudy Van records. Gelder. Yeah, exactly. You listen to some of that old stuff. It's it's super hi-fi. I mean, it, it, to me, it, yeah. like the low end is so warm and the high end is musical and present and good. At, you know, I listen to that stuff and I just think, man, you know, that is really hard to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've chased those kind of sounds for the longest time and I probably will be for the rest of my recording career. Well, at least in his situation, he was, well, first of all, he was recording in a house, wasn't he? It was, Which it was a home studio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, maybe he was at least sort of, you know, fine tuning the same setup for most of the ensembles as opposed to changing things around all the time. He didn't have to convert it for a punk band the next day. 
That's true. You know, but um, let's talk. I got another question about bass. Um, Anything but the answer by Hood Smoke, another record you did. I noticed it had a great tight picked bass and a beautiful low end on that track too. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about um, both recording the best bass parts if you're producing so that, you know, actually just having the right bass part is a huge th- influence on whether or not you're going to have a great low end on the record, I think. And then also, you know, when to pick finger or thumb. Wow. Well, the Hood Smoke track, first of all, the guy who basically writes all the songs in that band and is the leader of that band is a bass player. And he's a fantastic bass player named Brian Doherty. Um, He's one of my favorite bass players to record. And, you know, to me, of, of all the instruments, the bass is one of the ones where the most power is in the hands. Yeah. Uh, um, it, you can just do so much. And I play bass too. And I've just learned, you know, playing studio bass over the years, just like how much you can affect the impact of a recording by, with your hands using a bass is just amazing. And, um, and Brian, you know, he has this great old P bass. It just sounds great. And, uh, I think that one is through a B15, if I'm not mistaken, an Ampeg B15, although it might be a DI. I really cannot remember. I, I usually take both if I can. Um, and he chose to pick it. That's just how he played it. Uh, it was just one of those things. That that was cut to tape, which I think bass is one of the things that gets gets some love from the tape yeah. generally. Uh, so I find that a lot of the times when I've cut something to tape that just the, the low end is just a little bit. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we recognize that the bass always sounds good when it's cut to tape? What is it about tape that, or what, how would we describe what it seems to be doing to the sound? Boy, I, I struggle to describe it. To me, it just makes there be more cohesion in the low end elements of everything, the kick drum and the bass and 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 it subtly compresses so that it just behaves a little better. I feel like most things behave a little better when they've hit a good tape, good tape machine dialed up, calibrated. You know, yeah, it's it's um, it's almost it almost flattens the bass a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it flattens just like the naturally compresses together. it. Yeah, you don't have to compress it quite as much, and it, and um, that allows you to sort of want to turn it up more when you're listening. Exactly, exactly, and it's just like any of the you know with picked bass, you're getting some you know, like frequencies in the like 2.5 to 6K range that can be pretty spiky, you know? And tape tends to just musically attenuate those frequencies to my ear, Yeah, you know? Um, And so, yeah, when I'm recording bass, I kind of have, there's basically two, I I usually just take a DI. I have a, just this Jensen DI, this radial Jensen DI that I've for electric you know, bass, electric bass. For electric bass, yeah. Sorry, I should clarify. Um, and I usually use that into like an API or a Neve preamp and then either an 1176 or an LA3A. And, uh, you know, compress to taste. And then sometimes I'll throw some EQ on it if I'm really trying to, usually if I'm, I'll do like a subtle cut or a little bit of a bump in the presence area to just give it a little more presence. Now that track, I do specifically remember, that track has like a pretty hard, bump on the bass at like 2k with like an api 560 eq i remember specifically doing that i remember just felt like that because of the nature of the production that that bass had to really have a compelling grabbing in your face sound Mm -hmm. almost without being you know over exaggerated it's just such a you know the song basically just starts with mostly bass and drums and vocals you know and then some other things start to creep in and then the but at the beginning when the song drops it's like the bass better sound really cool or people are going to get bored you know with this little vamp that's going on there you know so i thought the bass has to really have a thing so i remember putting quite a bit of top end on it to make it even more sort of pokey like that. And, right, because you would just want to hear, and the, the thing you're probably listening for is that the pick sound sits just right in the track when you're doing that. Exactly, and that's not an easy thing to do. And I, I have to give Brian credit because, you know, he played to that sound and and made it so, <laughs> you, know, you know, he was able to control because it's so easy with a sound like that to just, for it to get overly dynamic and for things to just, jump out and sound awkward and weird. You know, it's part yeah, of the right. illusion again. Well, so, 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 so the pi- player has to really kind of, you know, be sensitive to that in the moment. 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I was just going to uh, add to that that you know picking the bass. It isn't. It is. This isn't rock and roll bass where you're like you're hammering down on it with a pick. This is the kind of thing where the palm of your hand is sort of resting on the bridge or or even yeah. muting the strings slightly. And it's the very pick Paul, is, very Paul. Yeah, McCartney. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when I hit the studio for the first time and started to see other people making records my eyes were opened to all these things that a bass could be. You know, it's like, you know, with when it was my band, it was the bass player that played the bass. What else is there, you know? And it doesn't sound so great. Uh, it must be his fault, you know, <laughs> or something. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's like the, the uh, or I just didn't even notice, you know. But, um, you know, there, there are a lot of ways to play a bass, um, like there are a lot of ways to play all the instruments. And each one of those ways that you play totally informs the tone and the the sound of it. And it's going to inform the whole mix and the whole song ultimately. Yeah. And, and it's one of the most important elements in most songs that I work on Yeah, in my, to me is the bass. I'm always listening to the bass and the drums. That's kind of where I end the vocal, but you know, as far as the, the foundation of the track, Bass is, it's also like the hardest thing to get right, the low end, yeah. right? That's what we're always just like, is the low end okay? You know, can we check the low end on a different system? Can I hear the bass on the oratones? Is it too loud in the headphones? <laughs> yeah. Know? I feel like I'm, I, I grapple with those issues as much as anything else. Well, maybe talk a little bit about the difference between playing a bass part when you can hear it in the control room through the big speakers versus the bass part being played when it's out on the floor with the band and, and in a pair of headphones. What are some of the benefits of either? I don't like headphones if I can avoid them. Um, I guess the benefit to the headphones is certainly you can, in some situations, just hear more nuance in things. Uh, but actually, you know, bass playing in headphones, I'm not as opposed to singing in headphones is the one where if I can avoid it, I like to. Okay. I just feel like singers do so much better without headphones most of the time. Bass playing, actually, I could I could even go so far as to say sometimes, like, because I play bass on records sometimes, and often I want, I'll do a take or two in front of the speakers and be like, yeah, I got to put the headphones on so I can really get inside this, you know, and just hear it closely as I'm playing. Um, I don't really, I, I guess I don't really have a hard, fast rule about that. I'm kind of like, you know, I feel like if there's a good bass sound going on, whether it's in the room, in the speakers, or in the headphones, then that's fun to play to. And let's go. You know? I feel for me, my bass playing experience has always been in the control room because I'm always adding the bass to something. And I definitely can tell what's going on with low end and tell how it's all fitting together. Um, sometimes I've, I've, you know, if I'm producing another bass player, they'll play much better when I bring them into the control room and we begin to get a sense of the tone and I can tell whether they're getting it right, but they might not perform it as well as they did when they were just out there playing with the band like they usually do. So I guess I just don't have, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't have much experience in headphones playing bass myself. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, actually, the, the difference between those two things. Because on one hand, I, I feel like in your hands is so much control of how the low end is perceived. So if you're hearing it really well in the control room, I feel like you've got a better sense of that maybe. And your dynamic might be a little more accurate. Whereas like when you're in the room, you're probably like raging out a little bit more maybe and not right. hearing the dynamic in the room quite as much. Um, I, I like to do it all different ways. I'd have to say that the control room is cool because especially if you're working with another uh, bass player, not you, because you're both hearing the same thing. Yeah. And and I think that there's something to be said for hearing the same thing with somebody when you're working with them. That's why like, I try to resist giving artists separate headphone mixes. Yeah. I really want them and me to be hearing the same thing so that we're all hearing the same music the same way and talking about it with the same sort of um, uh, reference point. <clears throat> so that's that. Yeah, I, I think that that's actually more valuable than anything. It's just I'm hearing what you're hearing. We're in the same space. Uh, let's talk about it. What about headphones? Um, do you have any particular headphones that you really like? Any particular headphone boxes? Any any method that you found of actually providing the musicians with a really good sound in their headphones? Or is that not a, not so important? 
So my favorite tracking headphones are either Shure SRH 840s or 940s. If it's a bass player, you give them the 840s because they have a little more low end. Or drummers sometimes like 840s because they can hear the kick drum better. Singers, I definitely like the 940s better. They're a little more balanced and neutral and and open. Um, I use what I do is I just feed a, a Rain HC6, slightly modded by my tech friend, um, and I just feed it straight from my console cue section, and I'll make a, a little cue mix on the console and I'm listening to that and they're listening to that. And that's just how I do it here. Now, sometimes when I work at other studios, one of the reasons why the artists say we got to go to another studio is because they want separate headphone mixes. So right. They want some then, kind of mixer like the hear back yeah. or whatever. They and those got. things sound terrible to me. Every time I put on <laughs> one of those, it is the least inspiring sound to me. I mean, even if the sounds are good a lot of time, like I'll be listening to the control room and, oh, this sounds great. And I have this little thing that I do a lot on sessions when people are doing their own headphone mixes is I'll go listen to everybody's headphone mix so that I can go, why is this guy doing this? You know, I can have a sense of what they're hearing and why, how it might be affecting what they're doing. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. And so and every time <laughs> I'll go out there, I will just hate what I hear in the headphones. You know, it's just like, how, how <laughs> I could not play to this. Uh, so I, I, I think Lanois is the one who's like really big on everybody kind of hearing the same thing. And I remember hearing him, I went and saw him speak one time oh, and cool. he talked about that and he talked about that. Um, and it was, it was interesting to hear his philosophy. He just said, I want all the musicians to be hearing the same thing so that we're all talking about the same thing when we talk about. So we're music. trying to make the same song instead of you know, five different songs. Exactly. Well, um, let me jump into the, the outro here and we'll ask just a few of the, the, the general questions that I always ask. Um, and then we'll, we'll close out here. But, um, when you were starting out in recording, what, what do you feel like was holding you back? Uh, I think my, my basic knowledge of how things work and my, you know, inferior equipment were probably the two <laughs> biggest uh, things that were holding me back. I had, you know, a very not good sounding piece of digital equipment, no good mics, and pretty much no idea how any of it worked. I mean, I knew how multi-track recording worked, but I didn't know how Pro Tools worked when I first got a Pro Tools rig. I just figured it out, you know, I just learned it. So, you know, there were a lot of, there was a big learning curve with, I understood signal flow. I'd worked on analog consoles and I had that, but the software was just kind of daunting to me at first. Yeah. Well, I funny mean, thing was, about Pro Tools is too, is when it started, it didn't even know what it was supposed to be yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so I think those were my biggest hurdles were just the, the, the quality of equipment, the better you get that in that regard the easier recording becomes not that it becomes easy but it just gets easier when you have nice mics going through nice signal chains and um and then just yeah my own sort of ignorance i guess yeah i don't know if this was sort of just before you got into this or not but do you remember the transition where pro tools was sort of like uh it was a piece of outboard gear to all of a sudden going wait i could just do the whole record inside pro tools i i got into recording sort of right after that yeah it was i got into it when like the mix plus systems started coming out and that kind you know where That's they had right. they, they started having the rigs that would run in the towers with the pci cards yeah. That's like the first thing that i remember and so and then you know before that the recordings i had made were all just analog and yeah. and adats i did do some stuff on adats which were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to say anything bad about ADATs because they allowed me to make a lot of records. At well, first. good, good. They were good for that. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So now, um, how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? Um, I think the best advice that I ever got was to take chances, to just really not be afraid of taking chances and don't worry about making mistakes. If if you're taking a chance and you make a mistake, that's better than playing it safe because you learned something. Yeah. And I think that was the best advice that I ever got. All right. Now, how about sharing with the rock stars a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something they could use on their next session today? Oh, okay. Um, 
Well, my, my, I'm going to do two little things here. My big picture one is always commit to the sound that you want as much as you can in the moment. Um, let's see if I was going to give a little trick. Okay, here's a, here's a cool trick for either like a Wurlitzer or an acoustic guitar. If you've got kind of a sparse production that sort of revolves around acoustic guitar or Wurlitzer and you need to fill up some space, but you don't want to put reverb on it necessarily, if you take, say, the acoustic guitar track, duplicate it, then reverse it, then play that back through a plate reverb, and then reverse and record it back in onto the multi-track, and then reverse it again, you get a very cool effect, which I call preverb. Right. <laughs> and it's actually, I'm certain that at least two of the tracks that you listened to that, that I sent you have that on there. <laughs> preverb, I like it. Um, and uh, there is no, actually... I don't know why it, it seems like they probably could make a plugin that does preverb, but um, I love that effect. And it's like that, you know, you hear the voice that's going like, um, Anthony, I'm coming to get you, but you hear Anthony. Yep. That's exactly I'm it. coming to get you. <laughs> that's exactly right. Great for spooky movies. Yeah. I mean, they used to do it just by flipping the tape over and, right. and playing it back through the plate and then recording it. You know how I learned that trick? Here's an interesting fact. I asked on a forum, Ken Scott, who's a famous recording engineer, was on a forum and we were talking about Trident Studios and there was all these Trident Studios stories going around and he was regaling people with, with tales. And I asked him, I said, you know, there's this, there's this song called Madman Across the Water. It's a record by Elton John and the title track has this amazing effect on the acoustic guitar. And I could never, I was, I was like, how did they do that? How did he do that? And I asked Ken Scott on the forum and he told me. And I thought, well, I can do the same thing with, with pro. He said, you know, we flipped the tape over and played it back through the plate and recorded it back and then flipped the tape back over. And I said, there's a way to do that in Pro Tools, right? I've got a plate and I can reverse things. <laughs> so then I kind of figured it out and I've used that trick a lot. That stuff is really fun to get into and it hurts your brain figuring it out when you're doing it. But once you get it, you're like so proud of yourself. It's like riding a bike. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, well, I, I probably hurt my brain a little riding my bike too. <laughs> All right. So now how about sharing with the Rockstars a, a, a favorite hardware tool or something you're excited about that you want to, you know, like hitting the studio with and want to let them know? Well, I think that the most important um, tool in the recording chain is the microphone. Uh, so my favorite hardware tool is my U67. That is just my favorite. Nice. Um it's just amazing when you just record things with good mics, how they'll just play nicely in the mix and how little you have to do to things. If you record things with good mics, assuming you're going for, you know, uh, big open natural sounds and yeah. real sounds, real sound. You're not trying to affect things a lot. Um, so yeah, U67, it's close second would be a good console. I like to work on I like compact. I don't like to have, I, one of my pet peeves in studios is going in and they've got a bunch of good mic pre's that are all different and they're all strewn about the room where I can't get my hands on like 10 of them at once or something, yeah, you know? Exactly. Uh, I like to sit in front of a board and, and push the music through it. There's something, the visceral thing about that, that I'm really attracted to. Um, you know, the way I have my setup here is like my console has four API mic preamps, but then right below it, almost just like right underneath it, I've got 12 of them. So I've got 16 preamps all in one little spot. That's great. And, and I can just, I just feel like there's a, a musicality to sitting there while the band's playing and just like turning more than one knob at once and, you know, pushing one thing up while you're pushing one thing down to get the sound really honed in. Um, so I like to have it in a compact space either a console or like a big rack of really good pre's that are all just like the same. And um, yeah, I'm also kind of a, use the same mic pre if you're tracking a band on everything when you're doing it live, proponent. Oh, same same build and model of mic pre so that you have a similarity in all these elements? There's just something about it. I don't know if it's like a similarity in the elements that, that it's just, there's something about like, I don't know, like when I record drums, it's like, I feel like I can get... The phase coherency just seems to be better yeah. for some reason yeah, when I, I record through the same pre's. I've probably I been doing too much video lately, but it makes me think of the the concept of color correction. 
Like if you shoot with a bunch of different cameras and then you try to watch the video, it's can, it doesn't look right. And right, so yeah. it makes sense. You know, you kind of shoot, you're shooting with the same mic pre's and, and um, it makes sense to your, to your ear and brain that way. Yeah. I, I, for me, it's my MCI console. And when I use a bunch of those mic pre's, I really love the way it all adds up. And I think I need yeah. to do more of that. Thanks for I'm saying kinda, that. I'm kind of jealous of your console, I have to tell you. <laughs> that, that thing, wow. I mean, it's, I, I actually had, had, I sold, but I had a Lang EQ that was owned by Tom Dowd. And he, he had signed the top of it. Oh, that's cool. Enough. And it was, I didn't even, when I bought it, I didn't even know. And it showed up and I was like, Tom Dowd, oh my God. Came from Miami and I think it was in Criteria, which I, that's where your console's from, right? Yep, Criteria yeah, Studio I, C. I, I would say that my Lang that I sold to my friend and your console were almost certainly in the same studio at the same time. Probably making the same great records. Yeah, there's some, boy, I looked at the list of that one. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, that well, cool. um, so Rockstars, I want to also give a shout out. So the, the U67, beautiful mic. I'm very fortunate to have one as well. But of course, if you wanted to get one today, what, like 10,000 bucks or something like that, um, but there is a great alternative. So I'll give a shout out to the Roswell Pro Audio Delphos, which of course you hear about from me a lot on the podcast. Um, but that is a U67 capsule and um, does also have a really wonderful sound to it as a, as a really nice alternative. It's not a tube mic, but it is a solid state, but it sounds great. Um, all right, now how about a favorite software tool? Anything that you um, are excited about? Well, I know this isn't probably cool or popular to say, but I just, I love Pro Tools. I know it and it's great. And to, and my favorite thing in Pro Tools now, they did, I don't know if it was 10 when they started doing this, is Clip Gain. Yeah. Clip Gain is a beautiful thing. I use that so much. I use automation so much less now <laughs> because of Clip Gain. And when that came along, I just thought, oh, this is amazing. Because I can literally, while I'm comping a vocal without turning on automation, automate it just fast, like right there, you know? And if there's a section that just needs to come up, I just separate it and push it up a little bit. And then by the time I'm done comping the vocal, it's just like, it sounds like it should almost, you know, it's, it's, it's right in there if there are some variances in level. So yeah, it's like getting I, it right at the source is now sort of built into the DAW. Do you use any of the clip EQ and compression features at all? I do. That's actually like my, my new favorite not new, but one of my favorite ways to DS vocals. If you've got like, you know, four moments in the vocal performance where the where it's like bitey and harsh, but everything else sounds great. And that happens all the time to me. I will just, you know, go in on that little moment, separate it, pull up a, you know, like a Waves Renaissance EQ, sweep around till I hear where the cut needs to be and then just render it. And there it's just like a hand ds little moment in time. Nice. Yeah. All right, cool. So now um, how about a uh, organizational tip? Um, you know, whether it's an online tool that you use or, or some method around the studio to keep all your shit together. Well, the newest one that I have discovered is Backblaze, which is a very cool sort of file saving. <laughs> uh, it's like a, it backs up everything on your computer you know, in real time, not in mm -hmm. real time, but it's constantly backing up and it's pretty close to caught up. It's basically to prevent catastrophes. You know, if let's say you finished a big long tracking day and you've got a whole bunch of good stuff and, you know, they were coming back the next day and you didn't back up that day and your hard drive dies, most of it will probably be on back place, you know? Right. And then you, if you want to get it back, you sort of log in and download a zip file or something like that. Yes, exactly. And oh, it's like I, five bucks a month. It's it's totally reasonable, you know, for that kind of peace of mind to me. I yeah. just thought it was a no brainer. You know? I, I think they also have an additional feature wherein if you wanted to get back like a massive amount of files, they'll actually just put it on a hard drive. You know, you pay a certain amount, and they'll just put it on a hard drive and, and ship it to you too, which is kind of cool and quick. I actually didn't know that. That's good to know. I think that's accurate. If it's not, well, then it's a good idea. You're teaching me about my resource. <laughs> All right. Um, now let's let's go to the uh, last hypothetical question. We're going to take the way back studio machine, and I go back in time, and you're going to find young Anthony, um, probably messing around with a M box, 
and you say, young Anthony, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself? I would say, um, don't be competitive. And what I mean by that is, uh, one, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I made when I first started and that a lot of people make when they start in engineering is there's actually two levels of competitiveness. There's one that's the, just like you feel competitive with the other people who are out there looking for the same work as you are. And I think it's good to resist that urge and to look at it as more like being a community. And they're not your competition. They're your community. They're a resource to you and people should work together on things and not try to compete against other people so much and worry about what the other person's doing and how you wish you had that job and just do your thing. And I think I got caught up maybe a little in, in feeling competitive and it got in my way of, of what's a more pure artistic uh, approach and endeavor. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, the other way that I th is to not be, you know, not be competitive in a sense of like my ideas have to be the ones that get kept, and just think about it like it doesn't matter whose idea it was. If there's a good idea in the room, that's good for everybody, you know. It, and if I come up with an idea and I hear it back and I don't like it, be honest with yourself. It's, it wasn't a good idea. It was a bad idea. It sounds yeah. terrible. Don't be afraid to say. Yeah, that wasn't a very good idea. Next, you know? And I think in the beginning, I was more prone to thinking, oh, that was my idea. I, I'm, I'm Somehow it's dear to me. And now, like, my ideas are not dear to me at all. It's like, I'm, I'm almost quicker to shoot down my own idea than somebody else's because I know right away if I think it's working or not. Um, and also, so, it's like, you know, the, as you do that, you begin to realize that the sh the sooner you move past this idea, the sooner you get to do a new one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that too. too. That too. I just think that humans tend to have this competitive streak in them. And it, sometimes it's good, I guess, if you're in sports or something like that. But I feel like in art, it just shouldn't be that way. That's like what's different about art than a lot of other things is that it's not competitive and there is no subjective better and worse necessarily. And so, I'm sorry, there is no objective better or worse necessarily. So, you know, you have to just be kind of modest and and not get too attached to things and just be, you know, deal with what's there. If it's, if it's good, it's good. If you think it's good, say it. If you don't, don't be afraid to say, hey, I didn't like my idea. Fantastic, man. Well, thank you for uh, being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here on the show. Um, let the Rockstars know how they can find you and follow you and learn more about the Drake. Yeah, um, my website is anthonygravino.com. G-R-A-V-I-N-O is the last name. Um, I'm also on Instagram, Anthony Gravino. And um, yeah, those are probably the two best places. There's a bunch of stuff on, on YouTube, I guess, that you're going to put up. And um, there's, you know, if you if you want, there's a bunch of records that you can check out that I've done. Um, that's about it. Um, anything exciting coming up for you next? Mm, let's see. Right now, I'm, I'm mixing this really cool record right now for this guy, Matt Eulery, which this is like the eighth or ninth record that we've done together. And it's a very cool, big, classical uh classical overdubbed <laughs> but it's 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 definitely an illusion <laughs> record <laughs> big yeah. illusion yeah, but I, it's it, you had yeah. um, you had included some stuff dark harvest was one of the songs you did with him and uh it was like piano woodwind strings just a beautiful sound in fact i was going to even ask you like you know how you manage all these thick instruments going together and have it you know make sense and not not just explode <laughs> Yeah, this record is similar to that one. Uh, and also, you know, that Dark Harvest track, everything except for the piano, bass, and drums was recorded in my little space. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, that's exciting. And um, just got a bunch of mastering projects coming up. I'm working on another Hood Smoke record, that one that we started in the theater and uh, almost crashed and burned. We're almost done with that. So I'm looking forward to mixing that and finishing the overdubs. Um, I, I feel like this is a relevant question for you right in Chicago. Um, generally where are you located and what's the, what are, what are three awesome places to eat and get coffee in that area? <laughs> I'm in Logan square, which is a Mecca for coffee. I think there's probably as many coffee joints per square foot as anywhere here. Um, best coffee in Logan square is intelligentsia. We have an intelligentsia shop here. All right. Love that. Uh, best 
food in Logan Square. Oh, gosh. There's a great sushi place called Hachi Kitchen that I love. Um, my, one of my, one place I love just closed. Um, let's see. I, you know, I can't say that I know like tons of good food. There's, oh, there's a great Mexican place called El Patron that just moved a lot closer to me recently, which has nice. me very excited. Um, do you so, remember yeah. a place called the River Kwai? I do not know. Okay, Where was, was a, that? It was a uh, Chinese restaurant that would not open until two in the morning. And, and we used to go there after working with Steve Albini over at Electrical. We'd go, I mean, it wasn't right around the corner, but it was this funky place and you'd go wait for like an hour for your food. So you'd be like 3.30 <laughs> in the morning that you're finally getting your late night meal. <laughs> yeah, Steve's place is not far from where, where I'm at, actually. Cool, it's, cool. It's, it's in the hood. I've worked with Steve once on a record. All right, Groovy. Well, um, thank you for all those extra tips there. And uh, thanks for talking to us for such a long while. And Rockstars, thanks for listening. Um, a reminder, you, you'll find the stuff we're talking about in the show notes on your mobile device right now. And you just click through or go to rsrockstars.com and just search for Anthony Gravino and it'll take you right to the blog post. We'll see you around the studio, Anthony. I look forward to meeting you in person. Thanks, Lidge. It was a pleasure. All right, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.